already been told I can't walk around. I got to stay here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can raise your hands. I'll answer questions, and and you might have to speak up a little bit so I can hear you well. Okay. What I've passed out on all the desks is a flyer that says real estate. On one side it says rental property. Forget that. On the other side, it's realtor expense worksheets. Okay. There are more of them up there. You don't have one. Okay. And I also passed out some calendars. Have my name on it, so you have my name. And uh, passing things out was Miguel. He was helping me, so if you didn't get one, it's his fault. <laughs> Thank you, Miguel. All right. I also passed out some mileage log books, which we're going to talk about. And there's more of them up there. You all need to have one. You all need to have a mileage log book. I didn't see a bicycle rack out there, so that means you're all driving. And then I passed out some exchange brochures on 1031 exchanges. They're all updated. Rules, regulations, and things you have to know. They're all up there. Make sure you can help yourself. Okay. It is tax filing season. And I guarantee you that in this group of about 100 people, hey, nice to see you, Bruce. I guarantee you in this group of about 100 people, there's at least 15 or 20 of you that haven't filed your 2011 tax return. I guarantee it. And I'll tell you something else. There's probably a half a dozen of you that haven't filed for the last two or three years. Now, you know who you are. Okay, you know who you are. I'm not going to point out what you are. You know who you are. Let's get these tax returns filed. People say, gee, I haven't filed because I couldn't pay the tax. You've got to file your tax return. The penalties are horrendous. So let's get these tax returns done. These old returns you haven't filed yet, make an appointment. Let's get tax returns done. I guarantee you there's a bunch of you in here that are behind on your returns. And by the time we get back to the office, there'll probably be a half a dozen phone calls of people that are making appointments to get the old returns done. That's okay. That's what I'm in the business for. When you go in to get your tax return done, you have to have a form like this filled out. You do not go in with a smile on your face. You have something like this filled out. You've been working all year long, and you're not going to remember what you did if you don't write it down. How many of you go to the grocery store? How many, everybody goes to the grocery store, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's say you make out a list of 20 items, only 20 items. You go to this grocery store, you can't find the list. How many of you would remember every item on that list? How many of you? I wouldn't. I can't even remember where I put the list. How am I going to remember what's on it? <laughs> what I'm telling you, if you don't write it down, what you did in a whole year, you're not going to remember everything, and it's your fault, because you will pay more taxes than you have to. You can remember what you did 30 minutes ago. How are you going to remember what you did in a whole year? If you don't sit down, go through your checkbook, your check register, and write down what you did and what you spent your money for. This is what you have to do. On this sheet, if the deductions that you want to take on your tax return is not listed on this sheet, it more than likely doesn't belong in your tax return. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Everybody has one of these. You need to look at it. You need to look at this list. You'll never see words like miscellaneous. Miscellaneous means you don't even know if it belongs on your tax return. But you put it in there anyway. If you knew what it was, you would called it what it was. And the IRS looks at stuff like that. I handle a lot of tax audits, a lot. 90% of my real estate agents, because some of the things you put down on your returns are not exactly truthful. Now that doesn't represent everybody here. It represents a couple of you here. You know who you are. Let me give you an idea. One of the audits I handled, which was not an agent from this office, had three kids, husband and wife and three kids, family of five, net income $12,000. <laughs> the IRS is not stupid. They know that that return has a bunch of BS. There were travel expenses for 30,000 miles travel for business. Not possible. The individual grossed $80,000 net income $12,000. He'd have made more money flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. Your tax return has to make sense. This is your tax return. It is not your preparer's tax return. If it's screwed up, it's your fault. You signed it. You're the ones that signed it. You're the one that said, I swear to perjury, it's true. And it's not. When you see things like that on your return, it's not true, and the IRS is going to come after you, and that's what makes me, it keeps me in business. 
called job security. <laughs> the largest expense on your tax return, the very largest expense on your tax return is the item that everybody screws up the worst. Everybody. I'm going to tell you the majority of you, 99% of you, screw it up. It's travel expense, mileage. Now, I passed out logbooks to everybody, okay? Now, I have old logbooks that I have that if you're audited, you have to fill out or you have to have a logbook. You can use your day work planner, but you have to have a logbook of some kind. And I have old ones that go back three or four years. They're for the needy. Only for the needy. That's because you got audited and you didn't keep records and now you need one. I happen to have old books. Okay? They're not for sale, they're for the needy. You have to keep track of your miles. Anybody here not know that you have to keep track of your mileage? Anybody not know that? Oh, you all know that. Certainly you do. So, since you all know that, how many of you Keep track of your business mileage every single day. Every day. How many of you? Thank you. How many? Two? Two? Three out of a hundred? That's not bad. So that means the rest of you must keep track of it on a, on a weekly basis, right? Exactly. Do you think I'm the only one that knows this? Do you think I'm the only one that knows that your largest single deduction on your tax return you just screwed up? That's why you get audited. So people say, okay. How many miles should I take on my tax return? The average full-time real estate agent will drive approximately 15,000 miles a year for business travel. Because more than likely, your farming area is about 10 to 15 miles in any one direction from where your office is at. That's average. Now, that's just an average. That doesn't mean you may drive more, you may drive less, but that's an average. So let's say I'm looking at a tax return and you just heard me say that 15,000 miles is average. So you get audited, and I look at your return, and it says that you drove 15,000 miles for business. That's a dead giveaway, you're lying, cheating, and stealing. That's a dead giveaway. You have no proof, you have no records, and you're just grabbing at numbers. You put down 14,865 or 15,130, but you sure as hell don't put down 15,000 miles. That's a dead giveaway, you have no record. It's a dead giveaway. You have no proof. This is your tax return. Don't let this happen to you. When your tax preparer is putting down mileage and he puts down 20,000 miles travel, all of a sudden, that's going to raise that proverbial red flag and you're going to be calling me. You've got to watch out for this. This is your tax return. Most of you will travel, will use about 80% of your travel for business. Total travel is about 80%. That's only an average. Now, people say, is it better to buy a car or lease a car? I get that question a lot. 80 to 90 percent of you should be taking mileage and not expenses. Unless you've, unless you've leased a car or bought a car that's $50,000 or more, and you just bought it, you take mileage. The mileage this year has gone up to 55 cents. Mileage is deductible whether you buy the car or lease the car. Most of you should be taking mileage. You can take expenses. If you take expenses, you take gas, oil, lubes, maintenance on your car, and your depreciation. When you turn your car in, after three, four, five years, you could have a capital gain on that car because you've written most of it off. Most of the time, you're better off with mileage. Now, the flyer that I put out asks the question about travel expense. It wants to know how many miles, how many business miles. These are the kind, this is the kind of information you need to be able to give whoever is preparing your return, whether it's me or somebody else. A lot of you are clients of mine, and I appreciate that. But you have to help me help you. You have to have some things written down so we have things to talk about. There's a, um, I was listening on the news, there's a special on a, on a Honda that you could lease it for like $199 a month, but you can only drive uh, 25,000 miles in four years, and then everything over and above that was 25 cents. You know, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. So you gotta be careful of this, you gotta be careful of the lease. What's the residual, what's it gonna cost you if you drive more miles than what you're supposed to? You need to be able to drive at least 15,000. If you drive 10,000, 
If it says you only get 10,000 miles, you're going to drive more than that. <coughs> Years ago, one of my daughters was in sales. So she leased a car. I told her don't do it, but you know, when, when your kids are 22, two years, 23 years old, dad doesn't know shit. Dad doesn't know nothing. <laughs> so she drives this car, and after four or five years, she turns it in, and she comes to me, she's crying. She says, I owe $6,000 on my car. I said, I told you don't lease it, you drive too many miles. You gotta be careful of leasing the car. If you're the kind of person that drives less than 15,000 miles a year, and only owns a car for three years or less, you might consider a lease. But you need to talk to your tax preparer and find out for sure if that's going to fit your situation. Every one of you is going to be different. So you've got to keep track of your mileage. This book will work. This book meets all the rules and regulations for mileage expense. And you need to put down where you went and what you did and why you did it. Now, one of the things, if, you, if you're audited and you don't have a book like this, or you lost your day planner, it'll always be a year or two later when you're questioned, it is legal to reconstruct. Now, I don't know what the difference between reconstruct and makeup is, but somewhere there's got to be a line there. <laughs> got to be that imaginary line. So you reconstruct from all the back information you have in your computer, okay? And you reconstruct your mileage. And you've claimed on your tax return 15,865 miles, and lo and behold, your mileage law book shows exactly that. It's a miracle how those things happen. But in all joking aside, you got to keep track of your mileage. Somebody said, if I only keep track of, of, of for half the year, will they give me the whole year? I said, no, they're only going to give you half the year. There's no rule that says they've got to give you the whole thing if you keep track of part of it. Keep track of the whole thing. Well, that's mileage expense. By the way, I handled more audits last year for real estate agents than I have in a long time. But that was primarily because there were a half a dozen real estate agents in the... Uh, Whittier, Montebello, East LA area that were investigated. I mean, some of those tax returns were terrible. But that's the kind of thing that keeps me in business. So again, this is your tax return. Make sure that it's right. You only do this once a year. Make sure that it's correct. Looking down this list on advertisement, the more explicit you are on your tax return, the less chance you have of being audited. Now, we all know what farming is, right? God forbid you'd put that down on your tax return. That, that person who's looking at your returns is not going to know if you're planting radishes or digging potatoes. So you call it what it is, flyers, handouts, calendars, whatever it is you do. The more explicit you are, the less chance you have of being questioned. Now, everybody wants to take everything that they can possibly take, but you don't want to be questioned, so you be explicit. And again, you don't use terms like miscellaneous. You call it what it is. If you're questioned on your return, it's normally two years later. Now remember, you're the ones that couldn't remember what you put on the list 30 minutes ago. How are you going to remember what you did two years ago if you're not specific? And you know, I really think it's a good idea to have a scanner. I really think scanners are necessary for anybody who is self-employed because you keep track of your expenses and you can categorize them and the ink doesn't fade on them and they'll last forever. I think scanners are a good program, they're a good thing to have, and they're inexpensive, $100, $150, and you've got all your receipts categorized for the year, every year, every year. I think scanners are a good program, and they're 100% deductible. Let me digress for just one minute and tell you one of the new laws that just passed, just passed uh, middle of last week. You know the Bush proposal that said that the uh, debt forgiveness on a sale of a primary residence was not going to be taxable? Well, they did extend it for a year. They only did that uh, not about five days ago. It's only extended for one year. Is it going to be extended further? Probably, but there's no guarantee. So you've got to remember that proposal is extended for one year that the mortgage, the, the debt forgiveness on the sale of a primary residence is not taxable. Okay? They extended that for one year. Okay, going down to this list again. Commissions paid out. Let's call them commissions and referral fees. You cannot pay a commission or referral fee to an unlicensed agent. Anybody here not know that? That's one of the questions on the exam that you passed. <laughs> Second or third time. Okay? <laughs> you can't do that. So, 
One of my clients had several checks written to individuals. The IRS agent says, you can't deduct these. They're not licensed agents. She looked up their names. I said, that's true, but they were assistants. She said, a what? I said, an assistant. They sit the open houses. That's why I don't take my clients with me when I go on audits, okay? You don't want to hear the stuff I come up with to justify what, what you just did, okay? They're assistants. They sit the open houses, and they talk to people, and they make sure that people are not walking through the house and stealing things. And they sit there, and they offer them candies and goodies, and they give them a flyer on the price of the house. Now, if there's going to be an offer made, they've got to call the agent up because there's an agent's got several houses, and there's assistants sitting in all these different houses in the neighborhood. That's an assistant. That's okay. You can give them a 1099. You can pay them, even though they're not licensed because they are, quote, an assistant. So the, uh, the uh, agent said, I never heard of that. I said, well, you got to look it up. Well, anyway, we've got to buy. That's all that counts. <laughs> I never take my client with me on an audit. God forbid they'd open their mouth and say something. And then I'll spend the next 30 minutes trying to explain what they said because they really didn't mean it. <clears throat> Real estate board fees, dues. The word dues is not deductible. It should not be on your tax return. Dues are not deductible. They passed that law about 10 years ago. Dues to a country club, an athletic club, a gym, a sporting club. Dues are deductible. Real estate board fees are. Real estate board fees, 100% deductible. You call it what it is. MLS. You don't put that down. It sounds like a disease. <laughs> you call it what it is. Multiple listing service. The more explicit you are, the less chance you have of being audited. Your tax return is selected for audit by an individual up in Fresno who maybe doesn't know anything about what you do. Maybe he's never sold a house, doesn't know an escrow statement from upside down, and you're the first real estate agent this student has ever seen. Because that's how they learn. When you're looking at your tax return, your tax return has to talk to them. Your tax return has to tell them what you do and how you do it and how you spend your money and what you do. <coughs> it's very important that you be explicit to help this person see this is what you do. Oh, okay, I see they're spending money on this. This makes sense. <coughs> Lockbox, super key expense, you all have that? That's what you call it. Lockbox, super key, use these terms. Classes and seminars, those of you who go to Mike Ferry classes, almost every client that I have that I handle an audit for on Mike Ferry that spends ten dollars or $12,000 on a Mike Ferry class gets questioned from Mike Ferry. Every time it's 100% allowable. But these auditors, they look at this stuff and they say, why would somebody spend $12,000 for classes or education? When this guy probably just graduated, just went through a community college. It's the mentality of the people I have to deal with. You have your canceled checks, you have your programs, you have your everything from Mike Furry, that's all that's necessary. But it is always looked at because it is so big. And it's out of the ordinary in your business. If you have to stay overnight at these classes, your lodging is 100% deductible. If you have to stay overnight and you have to eat, your meals are deductible at 50% of what you spend, not 100%. If you don't stay overnight, your meals are deductible. People say, well, gee, I had to eat. There's no sense in the regulation that says you have to eat. Only if you stay overnight can you deduct those expenses. Up at the top, e and insurance. You all have e and insurance. Now, uh, E&O insurance, Neil, they write checks for E&O insurance? How do they write to pay the E&O insurance? Well, put on a bill monthly. Some write a check, some put it on a credit card, and some pay it in bill. Okay. Most offices do take the E&O insurance out of the commission before they get it. This office and a lot of other offices like this, you pay the E&O insurance. And when you pay it, it is tax deductible 100%. And you have to be explicit. You call it what it is. You don't call it liability insurance. It's E&O. And that's what it has to be because that's what these classifiers are looking for. They're trained to look for buzzwords. E and O insurance. Office supplies is a big category. I like to see it broke down like it is on this worksheet. Stationary, postage office supply. You know, uh, sometimes I'll see on a return I'm, I'm on it, I handle an audit on, it'll say office supplies $3,000. Nobody spends $3,000 at Staples. 
Now, let's say you bought some equipment, you bought some computers. It doesn't go under office supplies. Office supplies are stationary and stamps and, and, and little stuff and, and paper clips and little hand staplers. Equipment goes on another spot on your return. That's another reason people get audited because they lump stuff in together that shouldn't be. Doesn't mean the equipment's not deductible. It is, but it doesn't go there. There's a special place to put equipment that's 100% deductible. It goes on the depreciation schedule, and then it's elected to go forward as a 100% deduction called Section 179. This is not new rules. This is not new. But that's how it has to be handled. Some of you pay a desk rent. Some pay a desk fee. That's 100% deductible. You write a check for it. It's 100% deductible. The desk fee is 100% deductible. Under services, we talked about assistant fees. Attorney fees are only deductible if they are to protect your business. They're not deductible for estate planning. They're not deductible for divorce. They're not deductible for any of that stuff. Only if they protect your business because you screwed up and your E&O insurance didn't handle it all. That's 100% deductible, but only if it's directly related to your business are attorney fees deductible. On telephone, everybody here has a cell phone. Your cell phone is not 100% deductible. It never was and it never will be, unless you have two phones. Anybody here have two phones? Some people do, okay. Then you take 100% of that one phone and nothing of the other phone. The typical expense on a cell phone should be 70% and no more. When, and you've got to save your cell phone bills. If you don't save your cell phone bills, you're going to be very lucky if you get half of it allowed. No cell phone bills, you're not going to get hardly any of it allowed because they don't have to. You and I, you have to remember, you and I are guilty to prove ourselves innocent. Like it or not, people say, that's not fair. Where's fair? Pomona, that's right. That's where the fair is. <laughs> it's got to be the tax law. You didn't have to. It wasn't supposed to be fair. Okay? So that's where, that's Pomona. This taxes. It had to be fair. So you got to keep track of these expenses and save your cell phone bills for at least three years. Why? Because that's a statute of limitation. Three years. Statute of limitation. When I, when I do a tax return, People come in to me, I said, what's your average cell phone bill? They say, oh, about $150 a month. Okay. So we put down $3,000, whatever it might be, and then I take 70%, and I put down cell phone bill, 70% actual. That way the government knows I know the rules, and I make sure you complied with the rules. So I'm going to say, I use my phone 80%. Okay, I'm not going to argue 80%. Who cares? 75 70 80%. But don't take the whole thing. It's not all deductible because you've got kids. They call you, you call them, you call your significant other, you call somebody else's significant other. It, it, it's not all deductible. It's not all deductible. What's that? Oh, that's, thank you. Family plan, that's really tough. Remember I said burden of proofs on you? You gotta figure how much of that is yours. Because you got four phones in the family. Yours is one of them. You gotta figure how much of that is yours. And that your kids calling overseas and all that stuff and the phone bill goes up. You gotta watch that stuff. You only deduct what you spent. Thank you, it's a good question. I get that a lot. Because you have the family that, com that combine everything. The responsibility is yours to figure out how much is your bill. What is your bill actually running? So well, I spend two hundred dollars a month on all my phone on all four phones. How much is yours? Oh, maybe a hundred. Okay, fine. Now we're getting there. So you have to be able to keep track and prove how much is yours and how much is not. Now, a fax line is 100% deductible. It doesn't make a difference why. It's 100% deductible. I never have a problem with a fax line. And internet, on the internet, if you have kids, if you're single, internet's 100% deductible. If you've got kids, no, by 50%, because they're playing on it, right? You come home and the kid's playing, you want to look, what are you watching that for? You know, got to watch the kids. They're looking at stuff. Maybe they shouldn't be looking at. What I'm saying is the Internet's not 100% deductible. People say, well, gee, uh, I only got it because I wasn't in this business. Does that mean if you got out of this business, you get rid of the Internet? No. Kids are going on strike. 
Okay? <laughs> so internet, 50% deductible, and I put that down. Internet, 50% actual. So the government can see that I know the rules and I'm making sure you comply with the rules. If you want to deduct any part of your home phone, you have to be able to prove that call you made was long distance and that's what it cost you. Now, I guarantee you, all of you go home, when you go home in the evening, you use your telephone to call clients. You all do it. That doesn't mean you can deduct your home phone. Hell, you had it before you went in this business. You can deduct your long distance phone calls, but you can't deduct the base rate or any part of that, only the long distance phone calls for business, and probably it doesn't amount to about that much, okay? Don't get carried away with a home telephone. You know, uh, on your, so a lot of agents put on their, uh, their uh, business card their home telephone number. I've seen that, home phone. So the, the, the agent says, the IRS agent says, I'm going to call this and see if it's really a home phone. He calls it up, and the phone answers, hi. And some five-year-old kid says, hi, this is Billy Joe, Bob, and, 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 and Spot the dog, and I'm sorry we're not home. That's not business. Come on. So be careful. You want to deduct that stuff. It's got to be business. It's got to be a, it should be a separate home phone that is business only. Entertainment. Entertainment is kind of a funny thing. Real estate agents, at tax time, all of a sudden, they're taking on a lot of people out to lunch and dinner. And I'll tell you something. I bought and sold a lot of houses. I have never had a real estate agent even buy me a soda pop. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. I'm using the wrong agents. I, I'm not probably true. Probably true. Thank you, Lydia. But most people don't take their clients out lunch and dinner. My God, you just sold in the house, you don't want to bond with them, you want to move on to the next one. You tell them to go buy a Pollo Loco, get them a chicken. <laughs> you know? About seven or eight years ago, the IRS did a survey. Am I moving around too much? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm over. Okay. The IRS did a survey. And the IRS office in Long Beach and El Monte did a survey, and they took 100 real estate agents, or uh, uh, IRS agents, that bought and sold property. The survey was to see how many of them had been taken out to lunch or dinner by a real estate agent out of 100. How many do you think were taken out to lunch or dinner by a real estate agent? One or two. One or two. There were five. Oh. That means the other 95 were lying. Okay? You gotta be careful. Don't take something that doesn't belong on your tax return. Just because you and your friend or somebody else's friend went out to lunch or dinner, if that's not deductible, said, well, me and this real estate agent, we sat and we talked business. Bull, you can sit right here and talk. You have to go to lunch to do it. Be very careful on this entertainment because the IRS is looking at There are really certain things they're looking for. They're looking at gifts. Now, when you sell somebody a house, you buy them a closing gift. I have no idea why you'd want to do that. I mean... Why can't the gift for them be the job you did to help them buy the house or close that's going to do that right? You're going to give them something that they don't even want or need, and they're going to give it away for holidays to somebody else. You're working too hard to make your money. You think because you gave them that door knocker or whatever it is you gave them, you think that's going to get more business for you? They're going to get more business for you because you did them a good job. Don't spend money. You don't have to. Don't spend it if it won't put money in your pocket. I don't understand why people give a gift. You know, on open houses, people have open house expenses. And I, I say, how many open houses did you do? Oh, I did about, uh, about 30 of them. And uh, how much did you spend on an open house? Guy says, I spend uh, $20 on open house. I ask why you do that. And look, got a kind of blank look on their face. Why do you spend that much money on open house? They're not coming here because you're feeding them. They're coming to see the house. And a lot of them are coming in, or neighbors that always wanted to see this house. They want to see what it looked like. They go by it all the time. They want to see what it looked like. They're going to come in, and they're going to be grabbing your candy and the cookies, and they're bringing some grubby little kid, and he takes a cookie, and he drops it on the floor and steps on it. Now you're going to have the carpet cleaned. Come on. Don't spend money you don't have to. They're not coming in there in an open house because you're feeding them. They're coming to see the house. Don't spend money you don't have to spend. Now, broker previews are different. Because if you don't feed the Asians, they're not coming. <laughs>